You know, I'm really encouraged by Carl's message this morning. You know, and one of the things that he said really jumped out to me, and that is this. Our world is changing. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever. That's the encouraging word of the word of God. We've got a God who doesn't change. We've got a God who cannot change. That's what Hebrews 6 was teaching. He can't even change if he wanted to. He's perfect. He doesn't need to change. He is completely dependable. And so I was, as I was thinking this week about our church's 40th anniversary, you know, I was reminded of Jesus's heartfelt declaration in Matthew 16, 16, 18. You can turn there with me. I'm going to make one other point in that passage. So if you want to turn there in your Bibles, that would be great. But this is really that declaration. I will build my church. What an incredible, I think, heartfelt declaration. You know, I've, I've often uh, thought, you know, carefully or tried to think carefully about the imagery that the Word of God uses with Jesus Christ and the church, and it, and it calls the church his bride. And, and, you know, I know personally how I feel about my bride. And, and the way that he feels about his church has got to be at least 10 times more than that. The care and the, and the concern. And, and he says there in, in 18, let's, let's just actually read verse 15. He said to them, Jesus said to his disciples, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter and said, answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my father who is in heaven. And I also say to you, that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. You see that phrase there, I will build, that, that, that verb. Jesus says, I'm going to do something. It's, it's what we see in the Greek. It's a future active indicative. Future means future from the date he's saying it. The indicative mood says it's a reality or a fact. You know what Jesus is saying? I guarantee I'm going to do this. I guarantee I'm going to get this done. The question is, what does he mean by this? You know, there's a lot of confusion about what he means. And, you know, one of the things that we want to clarify is, I don't believe he's talking about church buildings here. That didn't even become a thing until the third or fourth century. <laughs> he's not talking about church buildings. You know, we have this tendency in our culture to get, to gravitate toward the visible and the external. We, we are visible and external. And, and, and even, even like family members and, and close friends around the country, they'll say, John, how's your church going? How, how's the experience there? And I'll say, man, it's going good. And you know what the next question is? Hey, are the numbers up? You know, are, hey, are the numbers up? You know? And if I was like, no, we're actually shrinking, they'd probably be like, wow, John's in trouble. We need to pray for him, you know, lack of success. And part of that is our mindset gravitates to that. We do that all the time, right? We drive down the road. We see a church growing, expanding, growing, building. We're like, wow, that church must be doing really good. We just naturally gravitate toward that thinking. I don't think that's what Jesus is talking about here when he says, I will build my church. I don't think he's talking about specific local churches. You look all across the world and local churches come and go. Local churches will celebrate their 40th anniversary. And then at year 45, it'll be an empty building. I went to a, uh, a church, an old church building in New York, right, uh, about 10 years ago. That's a pizza parlor. <clears throat> they still have stained glass windows. I mean, it, you could tell it was a church. And now, now I'm ordering like pepperoni pizza, you know, hold the sauce kind of deal in a, in a church building. <clears throat> and, you know, quite frankly, some churches should shut down. I, you know, we, we, we look around the world and we, and we say, man, these, there's all these empty buildings in Europe and there's these empty buildings here. And there's, I think some churches should shut down. And you know why? It's because they get away from the very thing that makes them a church. That's what we see in Matthew 16. Simon said in verse 16, he, he answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And if, and if you're not preaching that message, if that's not the center of what we do as a church, we should shut down today. The second we become more interested in something else than Jesus Christ is the day this church should shut down. And you know what? I love what Charles Spurgeon said, a great quote. He said, if a man can preach a sermon without Jesus, mentioning Jesus Christ, it should be his last sermon. 
I totally agree with that. And if a church can open its doors and do church without mentioning Jesus Christ or being occupied with his work, that's the day that church should shut down. So Jesus isn't guaranteeing he's going to build a specific local church. He's talking about this global church. By the way, if you don't have the message of the gospel, just become a rotary club. Just become a mason lodge. Just go join the groups of people that are all about do-gooding into the community because you don't have anything. We don't have anything without Jesus Christ. It's not just the platitude we sing about to get us a little emotional. We actually believe that. Like, like that's true. We believe that's what the Word of God teaches. And so we want to be focused and passionate about the right things. What is Jesus talking about? He's talking about this, this global church, individuals that comprise this global church, individuals who have done, done what? How do you get into the church of Jesus Christ? You give a certain amount of money and you, you become a gold member, right? No, I mean, we laugh, but man, people think that stuff. How do you, be, how do you become a part of the church? You, you know, you, you don't park in the pastor's parking space. You park at the bottom of the hill, right? We don't even have a pastor, so that's kind of a joke. No, it's not that at all. It's the day that you realized you weren't good enough to go to heaven. It's the day that you realized that you deserved hell. If God gave you what you deserve, the wages of sin is death, you and I would deserve hell. Notice I included myself. I'm not up here pointing. I'm not self-righteous. I don't think I'm better than you at all. In fact, I sit here in these, in these songs sometimes as we're leading up to the sermon, and, I, and I, sometimes I'm like, I wish someone else could preach today because they'd probably get a better message than out of somebody like me. So I'm not, it's not about self-righteousness. It's about the good news of the one who died for you and rose again. The very penalty we deserve is the very penalty that Christ paid, and he paid it in full. And this is why he can promise eternal life, because it's something that once you possess it, you can never lose it. Why? Because eternal life that lasts only 10 years until the next sin or the next monstrous sin that you commit is not eternal. <laughs> if it only lasts 10 years, it's not eternal by definition. And so what an awesome message. This is how you become part of the, G the church of Jesus Christ. You trust in the man who died for you and rose again. You believe that he died in your place for you on your behalf and that he paid the penalty that would send you to hell. He paid it in full so that you would never have to pay that penalty. This is who Jesus Christ is building. He is building not only individuals, that's the focus of the church, but then when individuals come together in groups and corporate unity, then he builds that corporate body as well. Now, one of the things that we see in terms of this area of growth, I think it comes in two ways. Uh, numerically, you know, uh, Carl uh, alluded to this, you know, uh, EEG kind of sounds like a heart thing, like a, <laughs> an essential thing, right? Evangelize, edify, and we do it for God's glory. Very, very similar uh, concept here. I do, I do believe God is adding numerically to his church. Now, does that mean he's adding numerically to every local church in a local community? No. But is he adding people to his church globally? You better believe it. Through the faithful witness of believers, through the ongoing work of the Holy Spirit. We're going to get into the book of John next week. We're going to do a verse-by-verse -verse study through the book of John starting next week. But we're going to see when we get to chapter 16 in about five years, whenever we get there. Um, we're going to see that the Spirit of God is convicting the world of three things. Sin, righteousness, and judgment. Sin that they, what? That they don't believe. That's the sin he's trying to convict them. I mean, he, the Spirit of God wants people to trust in God's solution for salvation. Stop coming up with all their haywire, cockamamie solutions to sin's problem. He wants them to trust in Christ. God solved the problem. He just wants us to trust in his solution. And so he is adding numerically to the church. He's adding spiritually because we believe God is infusing life via means of the Spirit of God indwelling us, taking in the Word of God, responding by faith, allowing the Spirit of God to produce abundant life in and through us so that we grow and mature. This is how Jesus Christ is building his church. And guess what? He's always doing that. It's guaranteed he's going to do that. What does Philippians 1.6 say? It says he's going to complete what he started to do. So we know we can trust in the faithfulness of Jesus Christ to continue to build his church. And I love the fact that as you look at the word of God, God is relentless about a couple of things. 
And guess what? One of those things he's relentless about is you. If you're sitting here today and you don't know if you died, whether or not you'd go to heaven, he is relentlessly pursuing you and he wants you to hear the message that we've been sharing. Christ died for you and rose again. He wants you to trust in his son for eternal life. Stop trusting in your good works. Stop trusting in your church attendance. Many of us couldn't even trust our church attendance. <laughs> it's, it, life is busy, right? I mean, it's just like, it, it's sporadic some, some seasons of our life, especially you got little kids. I remember for years, I don't think my wife went to church for like six months at a time because we just kept passing sicknesses to the kids. And I kind of had to show up because I was the pastor. So she ended up staying at home. But God is relentless in his pursuit of you. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you know what? He's just as relentless in his pursuit of you today. He wants you to grow. Because living and walking according to flesh, living in carnality, it's no fun. In fact, I would make an argument that the carnal believer is probably the most miserable person on earth. And so he is relentlessly pursuing each one of us. And so based on this, when we talk about God's faithfulness to our church, Carl did an excellent job of reviewing the history, but he also did an excellent job of making a distinction. Because we can get a, a, a loss of focus there, and we can say, man, all these great people. And you know what? There were some great people. I, I wish some of you here today could have met some of those early people. I, I met some of them. I've never gotten to meet other people, founders. I would love to shake their hand and spend time with them. I really would. But when we talk about the faithfulness of God to this church, we're talking about God's faithfulness to this individual collection of believers in this local area. And it's specifically reminding one another, encouraging one another, exhorting one another of God's faithfulness to each one of us personally. That's what we want to continue to do as we go forward is just remind one another of what God has done for us in each of these years, in each of these days. He's building each one of us up. And when he does so, when we come together corporately, we kind of rub off on each other and we build something corporately. That's the whole goal, but it starts individually. And I want you to take away this morning, whether, whether you're a member of this church or not, if you're a believer in Jesus Christ, God is faithful to see the building project in your life all the way through. He is relentlessly about pursuing you because he desires relational intimacy with you. Let me just talk about a couple of specific things uh, with grace. You know, we've been literally a, a small part. We, we don't have delusions of grandeur. We don't want to be the biggest church in America. That, that's not our goal at all. We want to be everything Jesus Christ has designed us to be, nothing more, nothing less. That's what we want to be, period. We're okay with who we are, we, but we want to be who Jesus wants us to be today. We don't want to be what we were 40 years ago. We don't want to be somebody else in town. We want to be who we are, exactly what Christ has designed us for at this period of time. And so when we're just a small part of God's building plan right? in Noonan, Georgia, just a small part of it, but we want to do our small, small part well. It's kind of like when you're a janitor, you may be like, well, I'm just a janitor. I just clean trash cans. Well, clean trash cans well, right? That's the model. That's the mode. That's the attitude. I want this to be the spickest and span, spick and span, yeah. <laughs> I want this to be the cleanest trash can that's ever existed on planet Earth. I want people to eat out of this thing, be able to. I don't really want people to eat out of them. I want them to be able to. That ought to be our heart's attitude, even about our local church. Everything Christ wants us to be, nothing more, nothing less. So where do we go from here? <clears throat> How do we continue to facilitate what I would say and the benefit of the outworking of God in each one of our individual lives? Where do we go? Not only that, but how do we facilitate and benefit the outworking of God in our lives, in the lives of others that we come into contact with within our sphere of influence? How do we continue to play our small part in Noonan? Well, hopefully, uh, we've got a couple of ideas. You know, the, the leaders, as Carl alluded to, we, we pray about these things. We're like-minded about these things. This is what drew us uh, to one another. This is what keeps us together in terms of having a unified um, ideology in terms of where we're going. And maybe people would say, you know, that's outdated. I don't really care. <laughs> I'm sorry. I, I mean, I'm not sorry. When you're convinced from the word of God, until you're convinced otherwise from the word of God, you just keep going the same direction. 
Now, things change around here. I mean, the buildings change and carpet changes and uh, lots of things change. But the mission doesn't change. The vision doesn't change. The message doesn't change. By God's grace, we're able to continue to preach this if we uh, tarry another 40 years. But how are we going to do that? Well, we want to continue to equip you for the works of ministry God has called you to. This isn't a pastor-centric church, or at least we hope it's not. We don't want it to be pastor-centric. We want it to be people-centric. We want to invest in you so that you're more effective in the ministries God's called you to in your sphere of influence. That's the whole point. That's why Ephesians 4, 11 through 12, it says, and he gave, he himself gave some to be apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers for the equipping of the saints, for the work of the ministry, for the edifying of the body of Christ. Notice that as saints, individual saints are equipped, what happens? The body's built up too. So this, is, this all works together. So our passion is to equip you, is to provide equipping opportunities. And one of those things is we try to get, we don't try, we do. We get into the word of God every week. Part of that equipping is you've got to be uh, exposed to the teaching of the word of God. It's, it, it gives you something for your faith to latch on to because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. We want to provide that for you. We want to exalt Jesus Christ in your thinking. So when Tuesday afternoon, the, you know, the cow manure hits the fan in your life, you can say, you know what? I can trust Jesus with this. I can rely on him because he shows up, he shows out, and I've heard about that in his word. You know, the second thing we want to do is invest in the lives of those within our body from nursery to senior adults. You know, one of the, one of the things about uh, different parachurch ministries is they can focus on the cream of the crop. They can go, oh, I'm going to work with the rising stars, but I'm going to leave everyone else behind. You know, the great thing about local church ministry, we're all in this together. If you're a screw up, welcome to the club, right? If you don't have it all together, welcome to the club. Your, your pastors don't have it all together. It's okay. We're, we're together. And this is why Colossians 1.28 is so telling. Him we preach, speaking of Christ, warning every man, teaching every man in all wisdom that we may present every man perfect in Christ Jesus. Did you see a repeated word? Every man. We're in this together. All of us are in this together. All the way from the nursery, all the way into our senior adult ministry. This is the emphasis of the ministry. And I think we need to keep it that way as we go forward. We've got ongoing support of just local mission outreaches. We want to start at home. Some of you know that we're going to be out at the Coweta County Fair starting this Friday for 10 straight days sharing the gospel with whoever uh, will we'll sit down and take our survey. Um, in years past, we've talked to over four to 500 people in the course of 10 days uh, sharing the gospel with people who are confused, never heard it, never made the connection. And so pray for that. That's coming up. If you want to come out and be a part of that, let me know. Just let me know. If you want to bring uh, water, you know, for those that are serving, bring water and dump it at the church. We could use it. There's all these kind of ways we can participate as a body. We've got disciple-making tools. That's why we have the resource center out there. We're trying to uh, educate each one of us as to what's there. By the way, we can't possibly put every tool that we're aware of to help you in your, your own ministry out there your own disciple-making ministry. So let us know if you've got something going on that we can help with. We'd love to recommend something. We want to continue to support one-on-one, one-on-two -on -one, disciple-making activities. That's where the battle is won. We're not thinking big. We're thinking small. We're thinking equipping you and then encouraging you to think small. Who's that one person right now that you could meet with? Who's that one person you could study with? Where, where do you start? These are things we'd love to visit with you about. I mentioned in the video, a pastoral internship program. We haven't forgotten about that. We just haven't found the right person yet. But we want to develop pastors. We want to launch pastors out of this local church. I think we've got the, the, the ability and the, and, the, and the wherewithal and the desire to do that. And I say wherewithal, we've been setting apart some of our missions budget to prepare for that pastoral intern. Uh, one day. And so these are the types of things we're doing locally. We've got global outreaches. You know, we've got a, uh, one of our members going to North Africa. That's uh, soon. Um, and we, and we want to support her. And we're, we're tied to her. We're connected to her in this way. We've got two former members, full-time missionaries in Madagascar and Spain. We're supporting that. It's things that we're interested in, like-minded heart. 
We've got a continued connection to Liberia. The men that, that we train there with, with my team, we train up to 70 pastors twice a year. And so we've got this connection globally as well. And you know what? By God's grace, there'll be more to come. That's what we're hoping for in the future, a, a larger footprint influencing people's minds and thoughts toward Jesus Christ. That's the goal. You know, as we're talking about that, as we close, I think more importantly, we want to walk with you. That's, that's really what this church is about. We want to walk with you. you want, we want you to walk with us. In what way? Develop, developing more consistent relational intimacy with Jesus Christ. We believe this is best done simply by holding him up, pointing to him from the word, and then simply beholding him and finding in Jesus Christ the hero that you never knew that he was. We think about him oftentimes as our savior, but oftentimes we don't think about him as our very life. And he wants to be our life. He is our life. And this is so important. And so we want to model how to rely on him. You know, one of the things that we see is uh, this passage in Lamentations, very, very popular passage, obviously written uh, to the nation of Israel coming out of uh, being taken into exile in Babylon, but there's this encouragement here. Lamentations 3, 22 through 23, it says, through the Lord's mercies, we are not consumed because his compassions fail not. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. And you know, one of the things we need to realize as a church is we don't have to rely on faithfulness, on the faithfulness of God as, as leftovers from yesteryear. They're brand new today. They his faithfulness never changes. His mercies are brand new today. They're new every morning. And so we want to just encourage you as we walk with you, walk with us. Let's, let's exalt Jesus Christ together from this spot in this, in this small building in this community being just a light for Jesus Christ. Let me close there with a word of prayer. Lord, thank you for your finished work. Thank you for what you've accomplished on our behalf. We are so thankful for the opportunity you have given us to be a part of this local church here in Noonan for as long as, as we've been a part of it. We're so grateful for the heritage that you've established in the past through faithful men and women who have been committed to preaching your word and teaching your gospel. We're thankful for Pastor Carl uh, and his family, and just the, even the sacrifices they've made along the way, giving him the opportunity to invest as much as he had. Lord, I'm so thankful for my family as well, and the sacrifices they make uh, daily to allow me to do uh, the things that I'm able to do here. And, and Lord, I'm just grateful for this body who responds to your truth, who desires to exalt Jesus Christ. We, we, de we desire just to be a, a, a bullhorn for as long as you'll let us here declaring the goodness uh, of you and declaring the greatness of the, the word.